Okay, well, greetings everybody, and thank you very much for coming to the gallery. Um, this is our first artist talk of 2021. We feel as if we're getting into a rhythm here again, which is nice. Um, if you've had a chance to see the exhibition that's behind me, which is Ken Wywood's Anything Goes, um, you've, you've experienced some of the remarkable work that he has featured in this exhibition. And uh, Ken, we're, we're very grateful today to have Ken with us to talk about his work and his process and his thinking behind the work that he does. Um, Ken is an artist based here in Cape Breton, Kunamagi, Cape Breton, near Lake Ainsley, which I guess is actually in the Inverness region. Um, but Ken came to Cape Breton, so are we talking about 30 years ago? It must be about 30 years ago? I don't know. Yeah, long time. we'll go with 30, shall long we? Long time ago. Long time ago, yeah. I uh, came from Toronto, um, which is partly my old stopping ground as well. Um, after having taught in Toronto at the New School of Art and also at York University and in various other capacities teaching art, uh, he's very much an established Canadian artist. We're very fortunate to have him with us today. Um, he came to Cape Breton, uh, my understanding is, as a way of getting out of Toronto and into a different kind of environment, and obviously that stuck with, with Ken. And I think you see some of that reflected in the type of work that he does, which we're going to hear more about today. Um, before I actually begin and hand the, the podium over to Ken to begin his talk, I just want to do a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we do stand on the unceded lands of the Onu and uh, the Mi'kmaq peoples. Um, but I'm going to go one step further with the land acknowledgement and also read to you a kind of updated land acknowledgement by an artist uh, who um, I'm very familiar with uh, Elizabeth Dockstader, who's based on the Six Nations of the Grand River. She's a Mohawk artist from the uh, Turtle Clan, and we've had many conversations around the issue of land acknowledgments and moving truth and reconciliation forward. And as a, um, out of respect for her, I'm going to read her particular land acknowledgement, which is a way of trying to get a little closer to the truth and also uh, a call to action. So I'll just read her. These are her words. Uh, they're written uh, from the perspective of a, um, uh, from somebody whose uh, background is colonial ancestry, like mine, addressing uh, indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. And so her land acknowledgement reads as follows Many treaties were made between the indigenous peoples of these shores after first European contact. These agreements were made to ensure partnerships based on peace and friendship in part to protect the welfare of the indigenous coasts from the newcomers' overwhelming encroachment. As part of my recognizing whose ancestral lands these are, I commit to learning about the treaties in these ancestral homelands where I, where I live and work or go to school. Many broken treaties have made it possible for our European ancestors and families to live and thrive on these shores. Our communities, our towns, and cities took the lands with the most valuable resources from your ancestors. Our ancestors stood by and watched your people being removed from ancestral lands, medicines, and connections to holy places. Your ancestors were often relocated and placed in territories that were barren, isolated, or used as a dumping ground for our ancestors' businesses and factories. Lands and lakes were poisoned and in turn so were whole communities. Our ancestors imposed hunting and fishing restrictions based on our foreign laws, disregarding your ancient knowledge and limiting your right to feed your families based on your inherent rights. Our ancestors did not protest the forced assimilation policies that were later defined as cultural genocide of the residential school system or federal day schools that have continued to manifest as intergenerational trauma. Those legislative abuses were used as a facilitator for our ancestors to create title to lands that they knew were not theirs and to deprive generations of Native people from your rich cultural, te from your rich cultural teachings and knowledges. We acknowledge that our ancestors benefited from these institutions and we continue to benefit by not returning lands that were stolen as a result of these schools. These traditional territories have ancient laws. The original peoples of these shores continue to honor these responsibilities, to protect the earth and to care for each other with the focus on the health and well-being of the children and elders. We are obligated to honor the laws of these shores, to 
return to the original agreements of peace and friendship, we need to create a temperate society willing to correct past wrongs. We thank you for being patient with us in your ancestral homelands. As we learn, sorry, as we unlearn the history as we were taught and relearn what it means to respectfully live in peace and friendship in someone else's home and on your native land. Um, with that, I'm going to hand the podium over to Ken. Uh, so Ken, if you would like to come up and please uh, give us a warm welcome. And yes, I can bring up some water for you as well. Would you like water? Okay. I'll bring one over to you in just a moment. Right, so please join with me in welcoming Ken. Thank you for coming. I don't recognize hardly anybody, which is nice. It means my world is expanding. So uh, these are my notes, which I'm deliberately shuffling because I don't want to become too rational. Um, thanks. Well, right to the first page, CBU talk points. Um, art today which will be tomorrow soon enough, is based considerably on speculation and fashionable consumption. And I watched the girl with the pearl earring the other night. Have you seen that? It's beautiful. I had a piece of Jamaican sculpture, and I gave a party once in the winter. And the next morning, the sculpture wasn't there. And I might have, well, I did. I thought, was the sculpture there? But there was a, a bare circle of earth where the sculpture stood. So I knew some varmint had stolen it. <clears throat> and you know when, you, when something's stolen and you go to the space and the space is shimmering because it's empty? That's, that's that feeling. And we never had much of that in Western art. We always filled the space. And it wasn't until Van Gogh and a few others stumbled on some packing crates with Japanese art used as packing material that they realized so much of that art was based on what isn't there or what's shrouded in mist. Which reminds me, every time I come here, I have to go over Kelly Mountain and it caught me on the night of the opening, fog and drizzle. So the, <clears throat> rather recently, I, I started giving more attention to warm and cool in color in, instead of uh, other factors. And uh, somehow to my surprise, I realized white is cool and black is, black is warm. You probably knew this. White is dazzling, you know that. And uh, Greg was kind enough to subdue the lighting a little because light is destructive to color. I mentioned this to Greg a few minutes ago. No, I didn't mention this. I mentioned what I'll mention next. The word cool is one of the only words I know that doesn't lose its value. It's always maintained its value, that word. You can mess with it, but it's still, it's not cool to mess with cool. And cool stays cool, yeah. But I was mentioning to Greg that I heard a tale that every day, monk would go around the house tilting the pictures. Thelonious monk. And every morning, his wife would go around straightening the pictures. It's kind of like Jack Spratt. Um, I, I think they had a happy, a happy life together. <laughs> yeah. Then when I thought of black, I thought, does anyone remember Louise Nevelson? She was a woman in the 60s, I think, made large sculptures. She'd gather up orange crates and gramophones and just painted it all black and stuck it together. And uh, she painted herself, too. Heavy, heavy eyes. And 
Oh, I didn't put it in. I, I did a, a mask of her. I'll jump from that to... Uh, I heard an article on the radio recently. There's an influx, of course, of fake artists producing indigenous art. And I find it a, an intriguing term, fake art. We know Picasso said, artists, mediocre artists borrow, great artists steal. Yeah. Um, portrait tales, because there's no direct portraits of me or anyone else in this show. They're all a kind of a, an intermingling. Um, but I've done my share of portraits, and right now I'm watching uh, The Life of Rembrandt on Tubi? Tubi, I think. I was talking to my friend about this. God, I have so many notes, I can't talk too long on any one thing. But once I went to a fair, I thought I'll make some money doing portraits. And I wasn't very good at it. Nobody wanted my portraits. Then I got this idea. I scribbled a sign that said, draw me 50 cents. And people loved it because they could all make friend, uh, fun of their friends and the goofy drawings they would do. And I went home at the end of the day with a couple of hundred pictures and, and uh, a pocket full of change. The artist does that a lot. He lives by the change in his pockets. And a few months later, not willing to let any idea die, I hustled it down to the Art Gallery of Ontario, rather bust into his office the curator. You have to deal with, with artists, <laughs> no way around it. And, and I, before he could stop me, I'm spreading these all over his office, saying I want to show every man drawing the artist, you know, every man drawing me. Don't call us, we'll call you. you know. <laughs> Anyhow, more and more in my work, I've, I've realized that Whatever I do is springs from memory. And once I, once I stood outside a classroom of uh, Robert Markle, the large nude on the far wall in there, inspired that. And I used to hang around outside other classrooms. And um, I heard him say to the students, don't tire your, your net copying, you know, don't look uh, don't look down till you've exhausted what you saw with the last look. And uh, that stuck in my head, of course, because all is memory. So I try not to look. The way a lot of these landscapes in particular were done, it'd be a spot I'd drive by on my way to Halifax or something. So each time I'd drive by, I'd grab a little more uh, information, you know and take it home and, and exhaust it. <laughs> so you glance by things, you glance at things. And one of my favorite movies of all is The, the Horse's Mouth. Do you know that one? Well, Alec Guinness read the story, damn, I forget the author, and bought the screen rights to it when he was a man in his early 30s. But he couldn't play the part till he was in his 60s. And he held on to that. And then he did make that movie. And it's a marvelous tale of, of the artist and his life, especially as the artist starts to feel he's getting where he hoped to go. I don't know why I wrote this down yesterday. I used to hate things, now I can't abide them. <laughs> there is a difference there. <clears throat> I realized I went to art school, uh, you know, it was mostly about sex and drugs and rock and roll. And it was at that point where people were throwing classic casts out the third floor window and so forth. So I didn't learn near as much as, as I realized I could have and should have. But I did know that everything I was being taught had to do with European art history, you know, European masters and that. So. Also, so much of it had to do with the male dominance because the rock musicians were wired up and the painters were strutting their stuff and, 
and that. But as I looked around, I saw that school was filling up more and more with women. And uh, glad for that. And now we're starting to look through art history at the great women that have given to us. In fact, I heard recently they have decided that many of the handprints in the oldest of all cave walls are feminine, are women's prints. Yeah. There you go. So it took Picasso, who's looking, what on earth is that? It's an African mask. I gotta look closer at that, you know. And, and Van Gogh saying, what's this Japanese print in, wrapped around that vase and so forth to open it up, that Western now concept of beauty, of art, of intelligence, all those things. So once again, I won't say the artist led the way, but he opened the way. And in many regards, that's the role of the artist, to open things up. Oh yeah, finally, meaning today, not quite today, because I worked in, in film for a while, and uh, one day I was told I had to paint a graffiti set. I, graffiti, what's that, you know? Well, it's not that easy to paint graffiti, even if you know what it is. But graffiti was the first, perhaps, global art movement. Happened all around the world, all at once. In tandem with rap, by the way, which I still have trouble with. Um, but graffiti has moved off the streets and into the galleries, as it's bound to do. And I guess the king of all right now is... Uh, Oh, what's his name? Banksy. 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 Yeah, and he's well worth looking into and trying to understand. I, I hear one of his latest works, he, uh, it was designed to burn up or explode after you paid for it. And a few months ago, I saw something where the guy's selling something that doesn't exist, the, a virtual thing, you know. Anyhow, the art market, like so many other markets, is, is collapsing on itself because it's, it's based on unrealities and fantasies with the idea of remuneration, prodding them along. But what art really is, it's a way of investigating yourself, I guess, and, and a way of committing yourself. And... Maybe it's a ruse, but you, you persuade yourself that you're, you're contributing what, what you have and what you can for the sake of all. That sounds lofty. Maybe it's just an excuse because you don't stop doing it. I heard a story of, I've always been afraid that I, there's no progress, but yesterday I saw a 35,000-year-old bird sculpture. It was just beautiful, you know. There's no progress, no progress in art. Now, I don't know if you get better or not, but you get a little clearer, perhaps, at your intention. And when you see a child's drawing, you realize he's not trying to grasp at illusions. He's, he's putting down determinations. You know, this is the way the thing must be if, if, it's, if it's to function. So the leg might go all the hell over the page, but it gets where it got to get to. Whereas we're so busy copying the leg, we forget what it's there for. Some of us, some of the time. Yeah. So my friend Paul told me he uh, went out one night to make money drawing portraits by the side of the Rideau Canal. And uh, no business. But someone comes up and said, would you paint my boat? Within a day, he was flooded <laughs> with boat paintings and a pocket full of another pocket full of change. And I had a dear friend from the Maritimes before I was ever here, Frank Winterman, and he was living with me. And he'd go out nights to Yorkville. You've heard of Yorkville or been there. And he wore the, the weirdest gear, a light out his back, you know, with, and a, a, an energy pack on his back and his gear. And his, you see always uh, in art history, painters bundled down, hitting off, you know. Uh, there's a famous painting of a man who I had the privilege of meeting, 
uh, Jackson, A.Y. Jackson? Yeah, which is painted from behind. You think of artists painting their own profile from behind. Talk about memory. In a snow blizzard, painting the scene, you know, in front of them. I'm not that tough anymore. I, uh, I even stopped painting out the window. I, I, as I said, I, I, I go out in some warm vehicle and stare at things and then go back and finish them off. Um, mists of time, I don't know what that's about, but it makes me think of Japanese art. A singer here in the Maritimes once said to me, because I said something stupid, she said, a closed mouth gathers no foot. <laughs> that was Mary Jane Lamond, by the way. <laughs> I had a, a little gallery once, uh, right on the beach at Grand Etang, and uh, I'd gather <clears throat> debris on the beach in the mornings and take it back and tack it together and called it junk art. And it was very romantic, my little blonde children and the wind blowing, and, <laughs> and that was at the, the foot of Squirrel Mountain, which is the highest point in Cape Britain. Why would they call the loftiest point in Cape Britain squirrel? I, I never quite understood that. Not, not that I have anything against squirrels, but the wind twice blew my gallery away, literally blew the gallery away, gone. <laughs> and once the, the, I do like name dropping if I can, the uh, famous American photographer Robert Frank came walking down the long road to my gallery I saw him from afar and recognized him with his wife, Jane, she, Judy. So I go up to him and rather brazenly put my arm around him and said, do you mind if I call you Albert? And he said, no, not at all. Three days later, I realized I was thinking of Albert Frank, the Toronto alleyway painter. So, what a gentleman. Yeah, very, very wise gentleman. And his first claim to fame was a, a video called The Cocksucker Blues. I mean, talk about range of character. Eh? Is that the one made in Sydney? I'm sorry, I'm losing it. Just wondering if that was the one that was made in Sydney at a, a hotel. I don't think so. This was a, a tour with the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Right. I, he also did a video in, in Mabu where he took the fishermen and put them in, uh, in fancy suits for a fancy suit ad. Uh, what's that? There's a story where Renoir painted paint, painted plates, and they came out with a paint plating machine. Paint plate machine. A plate painting machine. I knew I'd get it. And he, he said, I can paint just as fast, I, you know. And it made me think of John Henry pounding away. And of course he couldn't. And, uh, one of the great English um, designers said, you know, the real tragedy in history is, is when uh, we could art, we could, uh, what's the word, do decoration mechanically, you know. Uh, because uh, now I hear they're even talking of, of dismissing cursive writing from the education system. I mean, it is a tragedy. And, and uh, we must do what we can at this point to speak up in these matters. Lines on a Greek vase, I love the way, it, you know, mostly they use red ochre and black, 
And you'll see the line weaves its way between the two. One minute it's defining the black, the next minute the red, the next minute it's on its own. And uh, apparently a, a young person once described drawing as having thoughts and putting lines around them. And uh, it occurs to me with indigenous art, be it uh, from Australia or Canada, or uh, often is not, doesn't draw those distinctions between within and without the way we do. Whether, as the early example, we want to fill the space and, and leave no space, or whether we want to separate what is supposedly from what isn't. And that's one of the very intriguing things about the art of, of the Aboriginals in those countries, that they look within and see without as being a continuum. And it's something I, I do believe is hampering us. Is that, how's the time? I have pages and pages here. Couldn't we keep going? It's 2.35, thanks, thanks for even suggesting it. Okay, we'll go a little bit longer. Yeah. Not at all, not at all. Oh, here's a short story. I went to art school in Winnipeg. And uh, as we know, it's cold in Winnipeg. This was in the dead of winter, as they say. And we, we haven't quite decided if hell is hot or cold, have we? We just know it's extreme. Anyhow, I would cut through the Hudson Bay to get from my apartment to the art school, oft as not with a large wet painting, which I did one morning and looked behind me and 43 overcoats with a swath of paint on the edge of the cuffs. So uh, discretion being, etc., cetera, I, I decided not to go through there anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, uh, I watched a, a marvelous war movie last night. That would make a great piece. Oh, my God. <laughs> What's that? That would make a great piece. Yes, Sorry yes. The crowd, but <laughs> it has all the oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I watched a really good war movie last night about the taking of, by the Canadians of, of the, uh, the Netherlands uh, near the end of the Nazi occupation. And... Uh, <clears throat> There'd be many stories and paintings and dramas of surrounding the role of art and the, the German desire to rule the world. And uh, many, many artists were destroyed physically and mentally. But my hero <laughs> just went down to the Riviera and got a couple of models and put the flowers in the vases and went right on painting beautiful nudes. And uh, condemned, of course, by, by some. And uh, I don't know, perhaps not lauded, but understood by many for what he was doing. I don't know which, which role I would take. There's a painting by Courbet called Good Afternoon, Monsieur Courbet. Pardon my French. And it's two wealthy looking guys on a walking trail and Courbet's in his pack and his sticks and his brushes and his motley beard. And, and uh, they're both bowing to him, you know, and he's giving the slight nod to them. And we were moving out of that era where art was basically the result of rich people hiring what was looked on as little more than a craftsman. Although, you didn't talk to Rubens that way. <laughs> and uh, the same way, perhaps, that uh, who did the Campbell Soup thing? Warhol. Warhol. 
I think I updid him. I, the, the wrapper came off my Campbell suit, so I set the wrapper on my shelf. And I thought, that's like a hollow Warhol. <laughs> but Van Gogh painted, and it touches us so deeply, the potato eaters. I don't know if it's the first time, whether well, Millet before him painted peasants in the fields. And so, but the potato eaters, it, it just wrenches your heart, as did he in his life. And in some ways, like him, I, I, I'm going to stop. Um, that's enough of that. Let's go look at some pictures. Thank you. Thank you.